We are live. Hello, my name is Elizabeth. I am the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus Steering Committee, and your host for this webcast. We acknowledge that we are hosting this event on Indigenous lands across Turtle Island, known as North America. That includes the unceded territories of the Mississauga, of the New Credit, the Wendat, and Audenoshani people in the place called Toronto. Today, I am speaking to you from Jamaica, where the Indigenous Taino and Arawak-speaking people began arriving here 4,000 years ago, but were wiped out by European colonial powers. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real, re real, real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Tonight's webcast is titled Canada, NATO, and the Threat of Nuclear Weapons with Tamara Lorenz, member of Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, and discussant Eve Engler, Canada's foremost foreign policy critic. Tamara will speak for about 25 minutes. Eve will speak for about 15. Then we take questions from the online audience. Audience members can submit a question by accessing the webcast directly from YouTube and by typing the question directly onto the chat column. They may direct their questions to a specific person if they want or, or to, to Hall. It's up to them. Please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. It's very important. If you agree with what you hear during this program, please join Socialist Action by signing up at our website, www.socialistaction.ca, or by calling 647-986-1917. Easy number to remember, 1917 was the year of the Russian Revolution. So let's begin. Tamara Lorenz is a P PhD candidate in global governance at the Vasselli School for International Affairs at Wilfrid, Wilfrid Laurier, University. Her research is on the climate and environmental impacts of the military. She's a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Tamara is also on the advisory committee of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, World Beyond War, and No to NATO Network. So welcome, Tamara. Good evening, everyone. It's really nice to be with you all tonight. Thank you very much to Socialist Action for inviting me to speak about Canada, NATO, nuclear weapons, and the new nuclear ban treaty. And I'm very glad that Eve is going to be joining me. I'm speaking to you from Waterloo, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples of the Grand River. For my presentation, I'm going to be showing some slides. So I'm going to share my screen with you now. Can everyone see my slides okay? Yes. Wonderful. I'm going to begin with a dedication. So I'm dedicating my talk tonight to my brother, who sadly died last October. And I'm also dedicating my talk to the Kings Bay Plowshares Seven, who are in jail right now in the United States for protesting nuclear weapons. Three years ago, on April 4th, 2018, the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, seven Catholic workers entered the Kings Bay Naval Submarine Base in Georgia. They hang, hung up this banner, the ultimate logic of Trident is omnicide. They spray painted love one another on the pavement and they poured their own blood on the official seal of the base. Last year, they were found guilty of trespassing and damaging US uh, military property. They are now serving year long sentences in US prisons. I've been working for 20 years on nuclear disarmament with the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, VOW. VOW has campaigned against nuclear weapons and for peace for over 60 years. VOW was founded in 1960 because Canadian women were so worried about the threat of nuclear war and the adverse impact of nuclear weapons testing on human health. Here's a picture of VOW members protesting outside of Parliament in the 1960s. Um, 
We might think that nuclear weapons are a thing of the past, something during the Cold War, and they aren't relevant today. Nuclear weapons and climate change pose the greatest existential threats that we face. In January of this year, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists kept the minute hand to 100 seconds to midnight on their doomsday clock. This is the closest it's ever been since the clock's founding in 1947, and it's getting worse. Under the Trump administration, there was a total collapse of the international arms control architecture. The US government withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal, the intermediate nuclear uh, forces Treaty, the Open Skies Treaty. Last year, the Trump administration deployed a new low-yield nuclear warhead on its submarines. And I have little to no hope for the new Biden in administration. Sure, Biden agreed to a five-year extension of the new Strategic Arms Reduction Tr Treaty, or New START. But at the same time, this is what's happening. So earlier this month, Admiral Charles Richard, head of the U.S. Strategic Command, warned in an article published in the U.S. Naval Institute Journal Proceedings, this paper, and listen to this quote carefully. There is a real possibility that a regional crisis with Russia or China could escalate quickly to a conflict in nu involving nuclear weapons. Consequently, the U.S. military must shift its principal assumption from nuclear empl employment is not possible to nuclear employment is a very real possibility and act to meet and deter that reality. Then Tuesday of this week, the U.S. Air Force did a test launch of an unarmed Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missile from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The first call that the new U.S. Secretary of Defense, General Lloyd Austin, made was to NATO, the Nuclear Armed Military Alliance. The readout of their call stated, the two leaders discussed the importance of their shared values, the current security environment, including maintaining a strong NATO nuclear deterrence. Let me uh, give you a little bit of background on nuclear weapons now. According to the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, there are approximately 13,400 nuclear weapons in existence. Um, there are nine countries that possess nuclear weapons, the US, the UK, France, Russia, China, Israel, Pakistan, India, and North Korea. The United States and Russia maintain over 90% of these weapons. The US and Russia also have about a thousand nuclear weapons each on high hair trigger alert. They can be launched in minutes. The US, France, and the UK are in the process of modernizing their nuclear arsenals. The US nuclear modernization program started under the administration of President Obama and Vice President Biden. The Obama-Biden government authorized the upgrading of the US nuclear trident on uh, land, air, and sea. And uh, last year, the U.S. Congressional Budget Office estimated that the cost of this nuclear weapons moderniz modernization program will be about $1.5 trillion. Now think about this. The nuclear weapons today are hundreds and thousands of times more powerful than the U.S. atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. The uranium bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, it was called Little Boy, and it was only 12 kilotons of TNT. The pl plutonium bomb known as Fat Man dropped on Nagasaki was 22 kilotons of TNT. These uh, smaller atomic bombs killed about 200,000 people and leveled the cities. The nuclear weapons today are much bigger, but I want to digress for a moment and talk about Canada's complicity. It is important to point out that it was Canadian uranium that was used in the atomic 
weapons dropped on Japan. Canada was deeply involved in the Manhattan Project. Canada established research facilities at Chalk River and Montreal to help with the American British Project. From the 1940s, Canada supplied uranium concentrate from the El Dorado mine and refinery in the Northwest Territories. To the United States, Canada also supplied heavy water from a smelter in Trail, BC to the US nuclear weapons production. And Liberal, Liberal uh, Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King admitted that Canada was party to the development of the bomb. Now today, a single modern nuclear warhead, if it was detonated on a large city like Toronto, could kill not thousands, but millions of people. Hospital, houses, schools would be destroyed and radioactive contamination would persist for a very, very long time and lead to a nuclear winter. Two years ago, the International Red Cross and the International Red Crescent produced an eight minute video called, What If We Nuke a City? It's posted on YouTube. It has 14 million views and I really encourage you to watch it. Um, so these nuclear weapons are the worst weapons of mass destruction. They are indiscriminate weapons for which there is no medical or humanitarian response possible. It would be total devastation if a nuclear bomb were to be detonated over a city. This is why concerned countries like Austria, Mexico, Ireland, Costa Rica, and civil society organizations like the International Red Cross and the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, collaborated to establish a new treaty to finally prohibit these weapons. So let me share with you a little bit about the process of this new treaty uh, to ban nuclear weapons, how it came about. In 2016, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution for countries to negotiate a new treaty to ban nuclear weapons, but Canada and other NATO countries voted against this resolution. In the spring of 2017, 122 countries negotiated um, the ban treaty, it's known as the TPNW. Canada and other NATO, NATO countries boycotted the negotiations. In September of 2017, finally, the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons opened for signature. Canada and other NATO countries refused to sign it. In December of 2017, ICANN won the Nobel Peace Prize for its efforts to bring about this new treaty. And it was a Japanese Canadian woman named Setsuko Thurlow who co-accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of ICANN. And I just want to mention here that VAU is a member of ICANN and Setsuko is also a member of VAU. Um, but uh, regrettably, after winning uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has refused to meet with Satsuko. Last year, Canada and other NATO countries launched an insidious campaign to undermine the TPNW. Uh, the US and other NATO members uh, have tried to get countries to withdraw their signa signa uh, signatures from the treaty, and NATO launched a disinformation campaign against it. Nevertheless, over 50 countries have ratified the TPNW, and it came into force last month on January 2nd. But Canada and other NATO countries will not join this treaty. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is considered the most significant multilateral treaty for nuclear disarmament in 50 years. When it came into force last month, there were celebrations around the world. Uh, here's a photo from outside Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories in the United States uh, that produces these, uh, helps to study and produce these nuclear weapons. And this is me and my kids outside in my backyard celebrating this new treaty. So the treaty bans the development, production, storage, transportation, threat of use, and use of nuclear weapons. It also bans countries from assisting other countries with their nuclear capabilities. It demands that countries clean up and, com and uh, compensate for com the contamination from nuclear weapons testing. Over the past 75 years, the United States, for example, has tested over 1,000 nuclear weapons on land, sea, and in the atmosphere, on indigenous land in Nevada and on the Marshall Islands. Um, the landmark treaty now 
delegitimizes nuclear weapons and it makes them international under makes them illegal under international law and it creates an important new norm it really shifts the debate the tpnw also complements the 1970 nuclear non-proliferation treaty but progress under that treaty was stalled this is why uh the tpnw has has come into being the TPNW has been ratified by over 54 countries, signed by more than 80. More countries are, are in the process of ratification. These are some of the countries that have ratified. New Zealand, Costa Rica, Bolivia, Cuba, Vietnam, Venezuela has rat ratified. This is a country that, can down, that Canada is conducting a regime change operation against and has illegal sanctions against. Nicaragua has rat ratified another country that has illegal sanctions placed against it. Ireland has helped negotiate the treaty from the start and has ratified it. And this is why Ireland got a seat on the UN Security Council and not Canada, one of the many reasons. Um, and I'd also like to point out that there are conventions that prohibit um, other weapons of mass destruction, like biological weapons and chemical weapons. So this new ban treaty completes the coverage of weapons of mass destruction. But there's an irony here. The TPNW is modeled after the Ottawa Treaty, the treaty to ban landmines that Canada helped um, negotiate and we led the initiative for. But now we are refusing to participate in a ban against nuclear weapons. It's ridiculous. Canada is not signing the treaty to ban nuclear weapons because of our membership in NATO. So let's talk about NATO. NATO is a nuclear armed military alliance founded in 1945 by 12 colonial countries, including Canada. Today, there are 30 member states of the alliance. Um, it's important to remember that most of the planet, 163 countries are not in NATO. NATO is dominated and dictated by the United States, a country that weighs $740 billion on its military. NATO preserves US-led Western domination and entrenches and expands militarized capitalism. Um, ever since NATO's first strategic concept in 1949, nuclear weapons have been a central capability. NATO always says nuclear weapons re remain the supreme guarantee of the security of the alliance. There are uh, currently three NATO members that possess nuclear weapons, the United States, the UK, and France. Five NATO members host American nuclear weapons on their territory, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, Italy, and Turkey. All NATO members participate in the alliance's burden sharing and all are involved in the nuclear planning group. group. Also, NATO members participate in dangerous nuclear training exercises. Six months ago, NATO did an exercise called Allied Sky, where six US B-52 Strato Fortress bombers flew over all 30 NATO allies for the very first time. The B-52 was built to carry nuclear weapons. This was an absolutely irresponsible, provocative show of force. NATO nuclear ex ex exercises are extremely dangerous. So earlier this month, the National Security Archive at George Washington uh, University released declassified documents about NATO's 1983 nuclear exercise called Able Archer. In 1983, NATO members did a simulation of a nuclear attack in such a realistic way that the Soviet Union's Air Defense Forces satellite system picked up the signals that a nuclear attack was imminent. Thankfully, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Stanislav Petrov thought it was a mistake and prevented a retaliatory strike. The documentary, The Man Who Saved the World, uh, tells Petrov's incredible story and it shows how close the world came to a nuclear war. You can watch it on YouTube and I really highly recommend it. So by 1992, the Berlin Wall came down, the Cold War ended, the Warsaw Pact disbanded. The Warsaw Pact, of course, was the Soviet Union's military alliance. It ended. Um, but at this time, the US and NATO promised not to move its forces closer to Russia's border on the promise that Russia 
um, would agree to German reunification. However, the US and NATO broke their promise. Over the past 30 years, NATO has shamefully expanded right to Russia's borders. So right now, Canada is leading a battle group um, in Latvia, we have 450 soldiers there. Canada is also flying fighter jets uh, from Romania along Russia's border. We have warships in the Mediterranean and in the Black Sea. Over the past 10 years, NATO has expanded its ballistic missile defense, BMD, in Poland, Romania, Spain, and Germany. Russia views BMD as a way for NATO to contain it and as a dangerous provocation because it can facilitate a first strike of a nuclear weapon. Um, and uh, sadly, this is a uh, situation is worsening. Last year, NATO released a new report and campaign called NATO 2030. It is extremely troubling. It says that nuclear deterrence will be maintained and it identifies Russia and China as targets. NATO 2030 is uh, a dangerous expansion campaign uh, expansion campaign of the alliance. A few days ago, Biden gave an address to the Munich Security Conference where he reiterated his support of NATO. Biden said the United States is fully committed to our alliance and I welcome Europe's growing investment in the military capabilities that enable our shared defense. The US constantly pushes its NATO allies to spend more on defense and this is to buy U.S. Uh, weapons. Remember, it was Biden um, who in the mid-1990s pushed for NATO expansion. Uh, the truth is, to rid of nuclear weapons, we really must get rid of NATO. Many progressives and peace activists don't want to be honest about this. The NDP and the Greens also don't want to be honest about this. The NDP supports Canada joining the TPNW, but it also supports uh, NATO. This is totally inconsistent. 30 years ago, the NDP had some courage and it, uh, to question NATO, but not anymore. Um, the NDP foreign affairs critic Heather McPherson is now a member of the Canada NATO Parliamentary Association. It's called CANA. Uh, many senators like uh, Mary Lou McFedrin and Kim Pate are also members of CANA. The Green Party, it supports the nuclear ban treaty. It doesn't have any members of parliament that are part of Canada, of CANA, but it is more ambivalent about NATO. Elizabeth May did say that Canada should question its role in NATO, but there is no party resolution against the alliance. I'd like to see the NDP and the Greens calling for Canada to get into the nuclear ban treaty and to get out of NATO. There should be nuclear disarmament and neutrality, not NATO. So finally, I'd like to close uh, with some ways that we can resist this and share some signs of hope. The International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, is starting to set, uh, stand up to NATO. This is really positive. And despite the fact that the US government won't join the TPNW, the city of Washington, D.C. wants the U.S. government to join. So Washington, D.C. is part of the ICANN Cities Appeal. There are many other cities involved like Berlin, Paris, Melbourne, Los Angeles, Baltimore, and Toronto. And they are pushing their national governments to join this important new treaty. The Canadian Voice of Women for Peace continues to work really hard on a shoestring budget to abolish nuclear weapons and to abolish NATO. We welcome you to join us. I'm also on the advisor committee of the No to NATO, Nor to War Network, and it's growing, and we welcome you to, uh, to join us and to, uh, to follow the work that we're doing. Finally, I'd like to invite you all to our upcoming webinar to mark International Women's Day. We are having a keynote speaker, Ray Atchison, who is the director of Reaching Critical Will. This is the disarmament project of WILP, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She wrote a chapter in a report for NATO Watch entitled The Patriarchal Militarism of NATO 2030. It's really excellent and I encourage you to check it out. So she'll be speaking on March 7th and it's free and you're welcome to join us. And finally, I would 
I'd love for you to contact me and I'm happy to share my slides and my resources. And um, just before I turn the floor over to Eve, I would like to make one final point. I just wanna show you a list of the treaties that the United States has not ratified. Just have a quick scan of this. You know, and, and think to yourselves, you know, why is it that our country has the United States as our closest ally? You know, why are we in an alliance with a country that will not um, ratify the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, on the Convention for Women, on the Convention on the Rights for Children? I mean, it's absolutely it's absolutely horrendous. We need an independent foreign policy. We need to work together across social movements to, to, uh, to get the Canadian government to join the ban treaty um, and to join the, right, uh, the rest of the world and to be on the right side of history. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tamara. It was very educational and an eye opener for sure. Now I am pleased to welcome discussant Eve Engler. He is a Montreal-based writer and political activist. In addition to 11 published books, including his latest, Left, Right, Marching to the Beat of Imperial Canada, Eve's writings have appeared in the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, Ottawa Citizen, and Ecologist. It is safe to say that he is the leading critic of Canada's foreign policy on the left, and aptly for us, he's a frequent speaker at socialist action events. Warm welcome, Eve. Thank you. Thank you, Socialist Action, for organizing this. And thanks to Tamara for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm going to be brief. I'm just going to talk mostly about, uh, about NATO. Um, I think that uh, people may have seen that uh, just yesterday there were uh, hundreds of uh, Twitter accounts were taken down. Uh, uh, and according to Reuters, uh, quote, hundreds of accounts with Russian ties were removed for amplifying narratives that undermined faith in NATO. <laughs> so Twitter took down dozens and dozens of accounts that undermined faith in NATO. Um, hopefully this, uh, this live stream, hopefully Jitsi is, uh, stays strong and doesn't, uh, doesn't remove this, this, uh, this uh, live stream. Um, for undermining faith in NATO, but that that would be uh, that would be the uh, the objective here. Uh, in the a, a recent presentation in November, Elizabeth May uh, Tamara kind of alluded to this that uh, Elizabeth May suggested in a discussion about Canada why Canada hadn't signed the uh, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Elizabeth May, the Green MP and former head of the party, suggested that if Canada uh, can't sign the UN nuclear ban treaty because of its membership in NATO, then it should withdraw from NATO. There are other people have, have suggested that uh, NATO, uh, since the end of the Cold War, that NATO is you know no longer uh, relevant and uh, you know should be should be abolished. What I'm going to lay out here is that NATO was never legitimate. Uh, it was never something that was in the interests of the majority of Canadians. Uh, it was always a tool of Western geopolitical uh, domination. Uh, in recent years, since the end of the Cold War, as we know, uh, Canada through NATO was involved in, is, is involved today, troops on Russia's border. Uh, there was a NATO mission that just uh, Canada led in Iraq until the end of uh, last year, a NATO training mission. In 2011, there was Canada led a NATO bombing of Libya, uh, where there was many Canadian fighter jets, naval vessels, probably special forces on the ground. Uh, that's turned into a total disaster uh, for Libya. Canada was involved in a long-term occupation of Afghanistan. That was a that was a NATO uh, NATO mission. Uh, and and that one, another one. You look at the situation in Afghanistan; all the thousands, tens of thousands of people were killed, uh, and now you have a situation where you know the Taliban is in control of much of the country. Uh, and you ask yourself, what was the point of that whole uh, uh, affair? Uh, in the late 1990s, Canada was involved in NATO mission uh, bombing in uh, former Yugoslavia. That was very 
clear contravention of international law. So this is a belligerent uh, uh, alliance. It's an alliance that um, that you know is. It says it's a defensive alliance that if you one country is attacked within the alliance, that they will respond respond collectively. But in practice, it's a uh, belligerent alliance that is is in in no way uh, or very limited in any sense tied to the actual uh, uh, North Atlantic uh, area. Uh, in fact, alliance it's really about uh, you know world domination. Um, to understand NATO, I think it is important to go backwards to what motivated the creation of NATO in uh, in 1949. Canada was part of the three countries that had the secret meetings in 1948 that would ultimately lead to the creation of NATO. It was the U.S., Britain, and Canada. And there was two real major motivations for, for the establishment of NATO. Uh, one was to undercut the left in Western Europe. After World War II, uh, the church, much of the, the, the corporate class, the traditional power structures in countries like Italy, uh, France, uh, Greece, they were very much discredited. They had uh, often aligned with the, with the, you know, the fascists, uh, and they were very discredited. And the, the left, communist movements, indigenous communist movements were uh, in ascendancy. They probably would have won elections in Italy. Uh, they did, essentially, in, in Greece. They were uh, led to a, a civil war there. In France, they won um, uh, more than 30% of the vote. They had a number of, the Communist Party had a number of uh, uh, ministers in the government after World War II. So there was a sense that the the way of the future was communism, was socialism, communism. Uh, and, uh, and so basically what NATO was, was a, as an attempt to bolster the elites in Western Europe uh, in their uh, opposition to uh, communism. And Canadian officials were very uh, open about this uh, at the time. Uh, Lester Pearson, who was a foreign affairs minister, uh, who was a major player in the creation of NATO, uh, uh, he, he described in, the, in a 1949, March 1949 uh, uh, discussion about the creation of NATO, he said, quote, the power of the communists, wherever that power flourishes, depends upon their ability to suppress and destroy the free institutions that stand against them. They pick them off one by one, the political parties, the trade unions, the churches, the schools, the universities, the trade associations, even the sporting clubs and the kindergartens. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is meant to be a declaration to the world that this kind of conquest from within will not in the future take place amongst us. So here you have uh, Canada's foreign affairs minister saying explicitly that Canada is uh, deploying troops to Europe to avoid Canada and the US are going to maintain troops in Europe to quote uh, avoid conquest from within right because the communists are taking over the kindergartens <laughs> um, so that was that was the one part of the motivation in setting up NATO and and Canadian officials were you know open about that and this is not just one quote there's many other examples I detail some of this in my book uh, Lester Pearson's uh, peacekeeping. Uh, the other part of the creation of NATO was about just simply world domination and bringing the weakening European colonial system in Africa and Asia, elsewhere, under a the U.S. geopolitical-led uh, uh, umbrella. Uh, and so the, the, the European colonial powers at the time were very much weakened after World War II. And they, to maintain their colonies, they needed North American uh, support. And that's part of what NATO was about, to avoid uh, the fracturing, as well as uh, part of reinforcing uh, European colonial rule, uh, and also avoiding the, the divisions within the European 
uh, uh, colonial powers. So part of this was the NATO Mutual Assistance uh, Program. And uh, Canada, between 1950 and 1958, delivered $1.526 uh, billion, around uh, 8 or $9 billion today, in NATO mutual assistance weaponry to the European uh, uh, NATO European colonial powers, France, uh, Britain, Belgium, Portugal, etc. Uh, and uh, Canadian weaponry, not, not sold, given to the European uh, colonial powers, was used in, uh, in uh, suppressing the Algerian uh, independence movement. Uh, it was used in, uh, by the British in suppressing the, the Mau Mau revolt in Kenya, by the Belgians, Belgians, uh, Belgians in the Congo. Um, and in fact, even when there was 400,000 French troops in Algeria, Canada was delivering bullets, giving bullets to the French, knowing full well where those bullets were being, uh, were being used. And that was to suppress the, the independence uh, uh, movement there. The, so part of what NATO was about was also about bringing the, um, the European powers under the British or under the American, the emerging hegemon, the emerging American hegemon, its geopolitical uh, umbrella. And, and Lester Pearson was very open you know, there's, it's about again. It's, the, the idea is this is a defensive uh, alliance that it's focused on. Uh, you know, the North Atlantic uh, region. But in fact, right from the beginning, they justified Canada sending uh, twenty-seven thousand troops to Korea in 1950. Lester Pearson. One of the justifications for sending troops was was NATO, and and American officials also cited the newly created NATO as explaining uh, uh, why Canada need to send troops. Uh, uh, to Korea, which of course is you know about as far away uh, as anywhere in the world from the North Atlantic uh, area, um, and Pearson was open about this in the House of Commons. So one speech he said, "There is no better way of ensuring the security of the Pacific of the Pacific Ocean at this particular moment than by working out between the great democratic powers a security arrangement, the effects of which will be felt all over the world." including the Pacific area. So he's talking about the establishment of NATO. A couple of years after the establishment of NATO, he said, quote, the defense of the Middle East is vital to the successful defense of Europe and North Atlantic area. In 1953, Pearson went further. He said, quote, there is now only a relatively small, about 5,000 kilometers, geographical gap between Southeast Asia and the area covered by the North Atlantic Treaty, which goes to the Eastern boundaries of Turkey. So basically, NATO, uh, the establishment of NATO uh, justifies European North Amer North American led uh, dominance of of uh, of the world, and I, and I think that to a large extent, not, you know, nothing has changed. That's basically what NATO is about uh, today. It's a it's a um, it's an alliance that the U.S. uses when it can. Uh, sometimes the U.S. prefers to go through, you know, generally would prefer to go through the U.N. and have a U.N. mission uh, pursue a occupation or invasion or whatever. Uh, secondarily, it, would, it you know, goes through NATO. Uh, if NATO countries are not on board, it's usually willing to go by itself or sometimes it would just get Canada to go, uh, uh, go with it. Um, but it's one of the tools to uh, justify, uh, to enable uh, uh, U.S.-led uh, uh, dominance of the globe uh, through through military means. Also, part of what NATO is about is about uh, putting pressure on countries to increase military spending and to to uh, align their military procurement with uh, equipment that's uh, interoperable with U.S. Uh, uh, military technology. So to to have uh, as much as possible NATO countries, Canada kind of at the forefront, that it the, the, the military equipment it buys uh, needs to be uh, aligned with the military equipment of the U.S., which leads to more sales from U.S. arms manufacturers. And it it uh, it's so it's good from the perspective of of the arms uh, industry. Uh, like I said. 
it's about partly about pushing increased military spending, the whole 2% of GDP, GDP back in 2006. The NATO alliance came up with the idea that every country should be spending 2% of its GDP on uh on uh, on on military spending, uh, and in Canada's case, that's been you know a tool that's been used for the past 15 years to put pressure on governments to increase military spending. So so that's uh, a large part of what NATO is about, and I, and I also have to understand that NATO, how central NATO has been to Canadian foreign policy, right? This is a central central alliance of Canadian foreign policy. Back in 1963, Lester Pearson said. Quote, NATO has been the foundation of the foreign policy of Canadian governments ever since it was formed in 1949, and it will continue to be so. In 2007, a uh, prominent uh, a military historian, Jack Granitstein, said, quote, NATO is the alliance to which Canada has devoted perhaps 90% of its military efforts since 1949. So, and, and things haven't shifted greatly since since uh, 2007 or for that matter since 1963 so it's really central to uh to canadian foreign policy um but as tamara pointed out it's not really questioned or maybe just around the edges is it questioned by any any official uh voice in canadian politics right maybe elizabeth may will kind of hint that we should pull out a nato if nato can't if NATO blocks us from signing the UN Nuclear Ban Treaty, but basically no one is prepared to uh, uh, openly and directly say Canada out of NATO, this is a tool of U.S.-led uh, uh, domination. This is a tool of, uh, of militarism, increasing military spending, and 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 we should have never never joined, and and um, and uh, we certainly should uh, should withdraw uh, uh, immediately. Um, and that's where that's where the peace movement comes in. That's where the anti-imperialist and the peace movement uh, need to be pushing that those ideas. And again, as Tamara pointed out, there's even elements of the peace movement that doesn't want to confront the fact that, seconds. that that we should be pulling out, pulling out of NATO. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Ethan and Tamara. So now we're going to uh, go to, with the help of our technical producer, Kurt Young, we're going to go take some questions from our audience. So we will do just two questions in the first round, and you have up to five minutes each to answer. And Eve will go first, and then Tamara. So, um, Kurt, would you put the questions up, please? Okay. Our uh, first question comes from Agnieszka Marzelek. Uh, she asks, how can we make Canada's shady support for nuclear weapons known more broadly to Canadian public? Ellen Ramsey asks, what can we do as individuals and groups to ban nuclear weapons? And Barry Wiseletter asks, if the workers' movement is able to force the Canadian state to quit the war alliance NATO, how much money would be saved? Okay, you have five minutes, Eve. Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of things we can do around uh, the Canada's refusal to sign the treaty on the prohibition for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The one element I think is important in that is pointing out the utter hypocrisy of the Trudeau government, where it says it believes in the international rules-based order, it says it believes in 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 uh, you know a feminist foreign policy, it says it believes in a uh, the ab abolition of nuclear weapons, yet it refuses to sign a treaty that strengthens international rules-based order by uh, criminalizing uh, nuclear weapons, uh, is explicitly a treaty that is an explicitly uh, a feminist uh, element to it, and obviously goes a step towards ab abolishing nuclear weapons. So, so the Trudeau government's hypocrisy on the issue is really flagrant, and I think it should be uh, uh, hammered at uh, uh, repeatedly and endlessly. There's many different uh, parts of uh, of the anti-nuclear uh, movement getting different cities to uh, 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 support the the treaty, getting uh, dub themselves uh, um, uh, nuclear-free zones. 
Uh, there is a Canadian Foreign Policy Institute where, where I'm, a, I'm a fellow with, and so is Tamara. We've organized a number of uh, 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 events on nuclear weapons in the past few months. Uh, those have been uh, well-attended educational events. There is a certain amount of appetite from the opposition parties, from the NDP, the Bloc Québécois, uh, the Greens, uh, to uh, take on the issue and to uh, do some campaigning on the issue. Uh, there needs to be a lot more. There needs to be pressure put on uh, Liberal MPs. There's a number of Liberal MPs uh, actually on uh, January 20, 21st, I guess the day before the Treaty on the Prohibition for Nuclear Weapons entered into force, the, uh, Liberal MP even joined the press conference calling on Canada to sign the sign the treaty. Um, so there's there's uh, there's appetite there. Uh, I think it's in large part about you know reinvigorating the the uh, peace and to war movement. Uh, with regards to uh, uh, the question of NATO and 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 quitting reliance and the money to be saved. I mean, I think it's that's a really uh, important part of uh, framing uh, some of these questions to people who are who are not, uh, you know, maybe they aren't anti-imperialist or, you know, maybe aren't that uh, informed in terms of uh, geopolitics, is to point out that, I mean, Canada is, is, is spending... Uh, a new report came out today. So it's going to be seventy-seven billion dollars to buy new fighter jets. That's seventy-seven billion dollars. People, you know, we say we, we, you know, we lack light rail. I mean, there should be seventy-seven billion dollars would give us light rail in all of the major cities, multiple, multiple lines of light rail uh, all across Toronto, all across Montreal, uh, Quebec City, Hamilton, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it would also do, you know, take water on on reserves, right? It, it would deal with the the problem of uh, 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 water advisories, boiling water advisories on reserves, uh, you know, many many times over from a cost standpoint. Um, so so we need to be putting that, you know, the, and it's the same thing. We're putting all this money into into new um, into new uh, uh, naval vessels as well. Similar, my uh, report by the. Uh, uh, PBO uh, um, saying seven billion dollars on on fifteen uh, new uh, surface surface combatant uh, uh, naval vessels. This is insane, insane sums of money, and this is tied to Canada being part of NATO, being part of the U.S. Uh, led empire, and a lot of that money could very easily and quickly be shifted to to affairs that have, have much greater uh, social utility much less damaging ecologically, etc. Okay, thank you, Eve. Tamara, five minutes. Thank you. I'd like to respond to a few things that Eve said and also to the questions. So NATO is definitely central to uh, Canadian foreign policy and to Canadian defense policy. In 2017, the Liberal government released their defense policy called Strong, Secure, and Engaged. Over the next 20 years, we're going to be spending $553 billion for new equipment to maintain high-end war fighting because of two reasons. One, because of our membership in NATO, and the other reason, because of our defense relationship with the United States. Uh, um, every quarter, Canada submits its defense expenditures report to NATO. And those reports are public. You can have a, a look at it online. And you'll see that Canada is reporting military spending of $29 billion a, a year. And that's at 1.3% of GDP. If Canada re reaches the 2% GDP target of NATO, we're going to be spending, you know, upwards of $45 billion annually on the military. By contrast, though, you know, we're spending for, you know, diplomacy, global affairs, $2 billion. The Department of Environment, which is the lead agency on climate change in this country, 
is you know has a budget of only 1.9 billion dollars um the the women the 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 office uh for um canadian women the status of, of women that office budget is 41 million dollars you, you know it's 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 ridiculous and military spending is going up despite the fact that we're in a climate emergency and we're in this pandemic um um, and, you know, and as I explained in my presentation, it's going to get worse because of NATO 2030. And I'm telling you right now, if NATO 2030 comes to pass, um, we will not meet the UN Paris Agreement targets by 2030, and we will not meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, by 2030. So we really need to unify and to amplify our voices against NATO um, it's absolutely critical. And this moment um, of this new treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons coming into force gives us, you know, this perfect opportunity to challenge um, Canada's membership in NATO. I think it helps us do two things. It helps us, uh, you know, get Canada to to take nuclear disarmament seriously and to start to question our membership in the alliance. Now, on the question of what we can do, I would like to urge people to contact their member of parliament and say, you know, you are you are not happy at all that Canada isn't joining this treaty to ban the worst weapons of mass destruction. You want Canada to join the TPNW. Um, and then, you know, contact your uh, city hall. We're working in Waterloo right now to get Waterloo to join the um, uh, the ICANN cities appeal. So there's lots of things that you can do, um, you know, um, get involved in peace and disarmament groups. There's a new uh, Canada-wide uh, peace network. You can join the email list and, you know, and get get more informed because all of these issues, you know, social justice, uh, you, you know, poverty elimination, uh, um, uh, you know, peace and disarmament, you, you know, it's all related. We really need to support each other. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention uh, really quickly, too, that, you know, after the Cold War um, and, you know, countries were kind of contracting their military spending a little bit, um, the, the weapons manufacturers were really worried. And it was Lockheed Martin, the worst weapons manufacturer on the planet, that led the U.S. campaign in Eastern Europe to get to get countries in Eastern Europe to join NATO because the weapons manufacturers saw NATO expansion as a way for them to, um, to open up their markets. So if you look right now at the Canada Associate, the Canada uh, NATO Association, um, we protested outside their office every month in 2019 for the 75th anniversary of NATO. If you go to their website right now, you will see that they are funded by the big weapons manufacturers, Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, friends, to to push back on this, to stop the expansion of NATO and to get our country to 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 uh, to take peace and disarmament seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. So now we're going to go back to our producer for more questions. And this time we'll be taking four questions and you will have up to six minutes each to answer. And Tamara will start and then Eve. Kurt? Okay, so our first question comes from Andrew who asks, how will exiting NATO affect national security? Spencer Roki asks, has a threat uh, of civil uh, of a civil war in America impacted the layout of the NATO situation in terms of how it would function if there were a political breakdown in the U.S. Daniel Terade asks, "What role did NATO play during the Bosnian War? Some justify NATO intervention as protecting those besieged in Bosnia. Is there any merit to this argument?" And H. Hadikin ask, are any of the political parties in Canada supportive of Canada ending its membership in NATO? Okay, you have six minutes, Tamara. Okay, uh, some great questions. Um, uh, so, uh, Canada absolutely does not need NATO for its uh, security. Uh, it's it's actually, we, we would be more secure uh, outside of NATO 
the whole world would be more peaceful and secure if NATO didn't exist anywhere. And I just want you to kind of compare and contrast for a moment Ireland. Ireland is not a member of NATO. Um, Ireland has a position that it will be that you know it will it will be it will be you know neutral uh, in a conflict um, and um, and 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 it was Ireland that you know helped uh, negotiate the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Right now, Ireland is on the UN Security Council, and really the international community, um, you know, chose Ireland over Canada to join the most important uh, security body, the UN Security Council, uh, because they saw Ireland as a more trusted partner, uh, somebody, a country that cares more about uh, international cooperation and 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 disarmament and, and global peace. And so that's why it's on the UN Security Council. Um, it's also important to think about the fact that NATO, an exclusive, US-led military alliance of only 30 members really undermines and circumvents the uh, United Nations. It, it, it really challenges uh, the United Nations um, like authority and international law. And uh, it was NATO that, that violated international law, for instance, by bombing Serbia in 1999. And Canada's former ambassador uh, to the former Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Albania said at the time that um, that you know Canada's uh, and NATO's bombing of Serbia, you know, was a, was a, a violation of international law. This is our former ambassador James Bissett, and he said in an interview at Carleton University four years ago that the greatest threat to world peace today is NATO and that NATO should be uh, uh, abolished. So, you know, he could see that from in 1999, that, that NATO bombing of Serbia, that it was going to lead to a pattern of illegal interventions, you know, by NATO over the, over, uh, uh, you know, into the new century. And that's exactly what we've seen. Um, so uh, on, on the issue of other political parties, unfortunately, we uh, don't have any political parties that have the courage to speak out against against NATO. Um, as I said in my remarks, the Green Party is ambivalent towards uh, NATO. They do not have a party resolution that says that they are opposed to um, to NATO. In fact, if you read the uh, Green Party's uh, uh, last election platform, you'll see that they're very pro-military and. Um, and you know, and the, and this is uh, you know this is really par prob problematic. Uh, the NDP they used to have some courage in the 1980s. They actually raised questions in the House of Commons um, against NATO, and I think that there was even a resolution at a time that they were opposed to NATO. But that's uh, that's gone. Um, and and now what we see is we see lots of NDP members of Parliament that are part of this Canada NATO Parliamentary Association. Um, what they should be doing is with drawing like the a foreign affairs minister uh, Heather McPherson that's on this committee she should publicly withdraw from this committee and say I am not going to be part of this because I don't you know our party doesn't support NATO in the same way that that the NDP doesn't support the Senate it shouldn't be supporting NATO the the NDP needs to think honestly about what NATO has done in the post Cold War era, and it, and it needs to say its time is up. I also want to say that if the NDP and the Green Party are serious about the climate crisis, if they're serious about the poverty crisis, then there's no way that they can support NATO. That's going to cause us to divert, you know, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars on the military instead instead of investing in our urgent social and environmental needs. So I want to um, urge all of you on this, this uh, call, if you're involved in one of these political parties, to put pressure on them to say, uh, you know, I, I want uh, Canada to get out of NATO and I want Canada to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and work with the international community through the United Nations on our common human security challenges. Thank you very much, Tamara. Eve, you have six minutes. Yeah, I mean, I think that the 
from a, a, any genuine security uh, standpoint, getting out of NATO is going to seriously increase Canadian security. Uh, the the biggest crisis that we're facing is the climate crisis, and the model of geopolitical empire uh, uh, politics that's tied in with NATO, not to mention the specific uh, climate-destroying elements of fighter jets, naval vessels, military equipment, but you, we can't, we're not going to be successful in dealing with the climate crisis without a lessening and ideally a, you know, close to elimination of the tensions between the U S and China, the U S and Russia. These are, these you know, genuine international commitment to, to fighting the climate crisis is, is, is essential. So from a security standpoint, that's um, NATO is a real obstacle uh, to that kind of uh, direction. Uh, I don't think that the recent internal politics in the U.S. greatly changed the NATO question. I don't believe that you know Donald Trump made criticisms of NATO, uh, but he more or less maintained U.S. policy towards NATO. I don't think that changes it much. My understanding with regards to uh, the bombing of Serbia, former Yugoslavia, was that the NATO bombing actually uh, stoked much of the ethnic cleansing of uh, uh, Albanian, uh, Kosovo Albanians, Kosovars and Albanians. Um, that's my understanding. And they then, they then uh, legitimated their bombing by uh, saying that there was ethnic cleansing going on, but in fact, it was the bombing that stoked it, a lot of it. Um, so I think that that's uh, uh, kind of puts that question, makes uh, a little bit doubtful on that on that question. With regards to the, the um, uh, political parties on NATO, I, I think it's in 1969, the NDP passes a resolution at its convention calling for Canada out of NATO. And it was an issue that had been debated at NDP conventions for decades. It was from, from like the founding of NATO, from, from like the 1950 convention after the founding of NATO, it, it got raised and the, the party leadership uh, did everything they could. This is a CCF, the predecessor of the NDP. They did everything they could to block the debate and the debates got gradually more and more, um, you know, more and more equal uh, and more and more. So uh, the establishment was always against it. But once the party membership, the party activists got to, you know, I don't know what the percentage was, but I got up to 70 percent, 75 percent, whatever it was. That was just too much for the party establishment to block. And the, for about 15 years, the NDP had a resolution. Uh, call it, its official policy was Canada NATO. Uh, my understanding is it's never actually been withdrawn, but when Ed Broadbent um, was doing well, I guess in 86, 87, uh, when he looked like he could possibly, you know, win the election uh, as the head of the NDP, he, he made a, uh, um, I don't know, leadership decision that this was no longer party party policy, or at least no longer the in their platform. Um, and when they started, basically, the media started scrutinizing NDP uh, foreign policy uh, positions, and so uh, there is no, you know, there there is political parties are not uh, calling on Canada or NATO. Um, but they weren't for decades. You know, they were in the NDP. They weren't for decades, and it was you know. 15, almost 20 years of activism within the CCF NDP that for, finally forced the party uh, to come out with a, a Canada to NATO position. And there's no reason why that type of activism couldn't um, couldn't uh, uh, have a have success on that front again today. 
Okay, thank you very much, Eve. Okay, so now we're going to go back for our final round of questions, and there will be three questions this time. And you have uh, up to six minutes to uh, answer. And we will start with Eve and then uh, Tamara. Kurt? Okay, so our first question it comes from Hans Modlik, and he asks, Germany's entry into NATO in 1955 cemented the Iron Curtain. What were the key events that only 10 years after the end of World War II enabled this about face? Barry Weisletter asks, only one power has used nuclear weapons against humanity, the USA, did it twice. Who will be the first to disarm nuclear weapons? Socialists uh, demand NATO powers disarm unilaterally. unilaterally. Do you agree? And Spencer Roki asks, a former military friend of mine once told me that resources, resource acquirement through NATO was necessary for the Canadian military to function. Are there any counter-colonial strategies for engaging military personnel and others who have essentially bought into NATO? Okay, you've heard the three questions. Uh, you have up to six minutes, Eve. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, if there are uh, counter-colonial strategies um, for engaging military personnel, others who have bought into NATO. I mean, I think that we need to reduce the size of the Canadian military. That's a, a central part. I mean, I don't think that even if Canada pulled out of NATO uh, or if, if NATO, the NATO alliance just you know, crumbled, the Canadian military is so deeply integrated with the U.S. military, that that is probably a, a bigger concern <clears throat> than the NATO alliance. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that there, we need to reduce the size of the Canadian military. The Canadian military is not structured in a way to defend Canada. It's structured in a way to enable the U.S. empire. That's, you know, that, that goes from a to Z in, you know, their, uh, from the type of equipment they purchase to the type of training to the, the, uh, the ideology. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I, the, I'm not, I, I don't know, um, you know, uh, what the ideal way is in terms of, uh, reducing the, the size of the Canadian military, obviously from, from one from day one to day two, you can't go from, you know, around a hundred thousand people that are employed in the military or D and D, uh, to you know, twenty thousand. Uh, that would be have quite a, uh, um, uh, a negative effect on many people's lives. But I think you, there are ways of you know, quickly, um, uh, reducing the size of the military and providing different forms of employment that's more uh, socially useful. Uh, it's of course correct that it's only the US that's used uh, uh, nuclear weapons. Um, I think that the, the, uh, the socialist position should be that, that the, um, the main nuclear powers and the main belligerent forces in the world, which are the U.S. primarily, but you know, secondarily, countries like Britain and uh, France, that they that they disarm uh, uh, unilaterally, or if not, uh, uh, you know, begin by begin begin by withdrawing the their nuclear weapons in a number of different European countries. Uh, begin by adopting a no first strike uh, policy, uh, begin by uh, slashing uh, uh, the number of uh, nuclear warheads they have. Um, all that's, uh, that's you know, easily done. Um, and I think that you'll find that certainly countries like China and, and Russia would be, will be uh, willing to, uh, to negotiate the uh, the co complete abolition. Also, things like having a nuclear-free Middle East. Right, the hypocrisy of the U.S. and Israel and Canada often uh, going on about 
Iran's potential nuclear the production of nuclear weapons versus Israel's you know significant stockpile is pretty pretty audacious stuff not you know and the US uh, even bigger stockpile um in terms of the creation of you know Germany's uh entering into um uh, NATO I'm not sure that I that I'm uh know exactly what uh, the answer to that is uh but I think that the the, the main answer of Germany entering NATO is the pressure uh, from from the U.S. Uh, and the the other NATO countries, and the the um, like I said from the beginning, NATO was designed to check the left, weaken the left in in Western Europe, and to uh, reinforce European colonialism internationally and bring bring it under a u.s led geopolitical uh, umbrella and that was the the primary motivation and uh there was a lot of pressure on the uh west german government uh uh to follow uh to follow that uh um you know to join the alliance and follow that uh that uh kind of policy Okay, thank you, Eve. Tamara, six minutes. Okay, I uh, just uh, want to share uh, a couple of book titles to respond to the last round of questions, and then I'll start answering this next round of questions. Um, so historian uh, David Gibbs, uh, a scholar in the US, he wrote a book about um, how the United States and NATO undermined, undermined peace possibilities in the former Yugoslavia. And the title of his book is called First Do No Harm, Humanitarian Intervention and the Destruction of Yugoslavia. And uh, an American journalist named Diana Johnstone, she also argued the same thing in her book, Fool's Crusade, Yugoslavia, NATO, and Western Delusions. And there are many articles that you can search for on the internet by Canada's former ambassador to the Yugoslavia, Bul um, Albania and Bulgaria, James Bissett, um, who also saw, you know, like firsthand how the United States and, and NATO were, uh, were fomenting violent co conflict in, in the Balkans, which um, eventually led to the illegal bombing of Serbia and Montenegro, et cetera, and then laid the groundwork for um, endless war that we see um, today. So uh, on, on um, the, the question about uh, NATO powers disarming unilaterally, um, I, I definitely agree. And I think that the United States in particular has a more responsibility uh, to take steps to disarm because like, uh, like it, it was said in the question, the United States is the only country to use nuclear weapons um, it, um, in, in conflict and and uh, it's developing new nuclear weapons in violation of its commitment to the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, uh, etc. And the United States and NATO are constantly uh, provoking Russia, and they're constantly treating Russia as as an enemy. Um, and and this new nuclear ban treaty uh, it calls for and supports a verifiable process for phase reduction of nuclear arsenals. So, um, uh, you know, th this new treaty, the TPNW, along with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, you know, with the guidance of the International Atomic Energy Agency, you know, you know pr provide the, you know, the legal structure to help countries uh, disarm. Now, the Can Canadian Voice of Women for Peace is not only calling for disarmament, but it's also calling for demilitarization. You know, we want people to think critically about what the Canadian military is doing. I mean, let's think back in the, the you know, just really quickly. I mean, think about the comments that Eve has just made, you know, the fact that, you know, Canada was in an illegal war in Afghanistan from 2002 to 2014. Canada bombed uh, Libya uh, with NATO. Uh, Canada 
uh, you know, bombed Syria and Iraq from 2014 to 2016. And then we did all the refueling of, of the bombing. Um, you know, the Canadian military is implicated in, in massive, continuous uh, sexual harassment and um, and sexual assault, you know, the, the chief of defense staff has just had to step down, you know, because he too, um, as well as the former chief of defense staff, um, I, I, you know, are accused of, uh, you know, sexual harassment. I mean, you know, this is very serious. I mean, the military is an organization that, you know, trains for, 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 for war. Uh, um, you know, they train to use weapons, they train to to, uh, to 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 make war. You know why are we funding this organization? You know, you know why are we buying into the fact that uh, you know because we're a, you know a member of NATO, because you know we have a military, you know we have to spend so much money, you know, for weapons to spend so much money for these um, destabilizing, illegitimate, illegal operations. You, you know, let's. You know, let's say no. Let's say no to it all. No to no to military. No to weapons. No to soldiers. You know, Costa Rica. You know, shows us the way. In 1949, uh, Costa Rica abolished it, it, its military. It, 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 it said, you know, we do not want our children to to be soldiers and to kill other children. And they celebrate every December first every year the fact that they don't have a military. It's called, you know, um, National Abolished Military day and um and, and it's and they say costa rica you know is the country that helped lead the negotiations on the nuclear ban treaty and costa rica said because of its experience with demilitarization it has uh you know the tools now um and the foundation for decarbonization it's costa rica that you know wants to totally decarbonize the country um and you know be completely renewable in the, you know in the next couple of years um it's it's Costa Rica, a country with no military that is showing leadership on disarmament and peace and on climate action. So let's follow that example. You know, we, we've got to end war if we're serious about, like Eve said, the climate crisis and the poverty crisis. Thank you, Tamar. So we have a little bit of time. So I would like to go back to Eve, Eve if you would like two minutes to, to wrap up or if there's something more you would like to say. Eve? Uh, no, I mean, if my son will probably come in and disrupt me if I go on too long, but the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute is hoping to have uh, do a webinar on Canada out of NATO uh, for early April that people can uh, check out. Uh, we're doing an event, uh, we're film screening uh, on uh, uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday evening, the film Haiti Betrayed, which is a great film on Canada's role in Haiti. And uh, the film is available for free for the next few days, and then there will be a discussion with the filmmaker. Um, but but mostly, I think it you know if we want uh, Canada out of NATO, if we want Canada to sign the UN Nuclear Ban Treaty, um, we need to get active. We need to mobilize. We need to uh, rejuvenate the uh, peace movement. We need to uh, build uh, an anti-imperialist movement. And uh, you know this stuff has been done. Uh, uh, it can be done uh, going forward. And it's uh, it's absolutely uh, essential, uh, I think, particularly in the context of the uh, the climate crisis. Thank you, Eve. Tamara, two minutes, if you like. I just want to encourage everyone to to be brave, to say no to NATO, to say yes to the nuclear ban treaty, um, to you know, to have the courage to say that you know. That, that NATO is a, a military alliance engaged in violence. It's a racist institution. Its time is up and we need to get out of it. Um, I also want to encourage you to uh, check out some upcoming events that the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace has going on this Saturday. We're doing a uh, Fast uh, for Justice webinar. We have some really fantastic speakers who have experience about using the the the, the tool of, of of fasting for social change. Uh, people like Kathy Kelly, Matthew Barons, Lynn Adamson. That's taking place at two o'clock this Saturday, and. Um, 
The Winnipeg Peace Alliance also is having a uh, discussion on the new Cold War um, and the peace movement and how we can uh, uh, stop this new Cold War and this new arms race. And that's also this Saturday at 2 p.m. You can find out information at the Peace Alliance Winnipeg. You can find out information about the Fast for Justice uh, webinar uh, this Saturday at the World Beyond War Canada website. And then finally, just to remind you to uh, join us on International Women's uh, for International Women's Day on Sunday, March 7th at uh, 2 o'clock for the No to NATO, no, to NATO, no to, uh, War Network's uh, really fantastic uh, talk with uh, Ray Atchison on the patriarchy of NATO. Thanks okay, a lot thank for having me. Thank you. Okay, a special thanks to Tamara and Eve and to Kurt, our producer in Mississauga, of course, and to everyone who participated in tonight's uh, webcast. Please consider being a supporter of Socialist Action Newspaper which we will send to you online. To fill out the form, you just visit our website at www.socialsaction.ca. If you would like to talk to us about joining SA, write to socialsactioncanada at gmail.com or just give us a call at 647-986-1917, 647-986-1917. And once again, folks, if, you'd like to if you like the show, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. The next essay webcast will be on thursday march the 4th at 7 p.m eastern time it's a special occasion celebrate international women's day with music and speakers and our music and speakers will come from pei quebec ontario british columbia usa and ireland so please mark it on your calendar i expect to see you all here i also invite you to an important event on sunday february the 28th at 1 p.m eastern time it's the online workers action movement better known as wham conference following the success of the wham campaign at the ontario federation of labor in 2019 we are now launching a strong fight for new policies and leaders at the canadian labor congress convention in june 2021 the WAM conference will focus on current trends in the labor movement. We will hear from activists who work on the ground fighting for workers' rights to call out the misleaders of our unions and the lack of progress in fighting systemic racism, concession bargaining, and, and eco catastrophe. And so there will be two sessions one at one and continuing on another one at three at our first one, there will be a speaker from the Molson locked out employees and also. Debbie McGinnis from an LBCBO worker who's a, an officer local president. Greg Mady, a pre president of Edmonton and District Labor Council, who's also a member of CUPW. Nicholas Thompson, a social justice activist who is leading the Black Class Action Lawsuit against the federal government for systemic discrimination, and also the president of a PSAC local. And then the second session, we'll have speakers to prepare for the CLC convention, which in includes Barry Conway, uh, a QP member in Hamilton, past WAM candidate for president of the Ontario Federation of Labor, who received 36% support vote in 2019. And we have Sandra Griffith Bonaparte. She's the president of UNDE local. Local Stephen uh, Crozier, a past president of New West Minister and District Labor Council in British Columbia, and Julia Zarscott, the executive board member of Ontario Public Service Employees Union Region 5, and a member of the WAM Steering Committee. So join the conference on Sunday, February 28th, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. In the meantime, please be safe, stay healthy, and stay active. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. Thank you.